Welcome to uh, CSIS. Uh, I'm Scott Kennedy. Um, I almost said good night because uh, I just uh, arrived back from Beijing uh, <laughs> late yesterday, and my jet lag tells me it's the evening. And uh, one of the most surprising things I found uh, as, a, as a traveler uh, to China uh, this past few weeks and, and being in Beijing is, is how the air got worse over the past 10 days, not better, because you think uh, Xi Jinping is supposed to set this up just right to have the air start bad and get better, 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 better over the time of the MPC. But APEC members uh, get blue skies in Beijing, but NPC deputies don't, I guess. <laughs> I think that's the rule. So uh, today is the uh, start of March Madness, as you know. And uh, so if you're on your phones doing your picks at the end, just be careful about that. Uh, China has a different kind of annual March Madness, uh, the two sessions, uh, the meetings of the Chinese, China People's Political Consultative Conference and the National People's Congress. This is the first session of the 13th NPC. And by all indications, as we're going to hear from our guests, this has been an historic uh, two weeks. There's another important first that we did not predict. Uh, the NPC is not ending today. It's ending on the 20th, uh, which is five days longer than usual. Uh, because usually by now, we'd have seen the work reports, the new pieces of legislation, the personnel appointments. Uh, but there's still a few days left. And in fact, today, if you were in Beijing, uh, it's a day of rest for the NPC deputies. Uh, in fact, they're out. They're playing tourists today in, in Beijing uh, while the leadership takes into account all of the suggestions they made for re potential edits to the supervision law, which is going to be uh, passed uh, soon. So, and we would have held this event on the 20th, uh, but we, were, we're, we are already hosting another event on that day. Uh, Chen Zhu, the mayor of Kaohsiung, will be giving a speech here at CSIS that afternoon starting at 4 o'clock. So we have a full calendar as well as uh, the folks in Beijing. Uh, but we've got a lot to talk about today. And luckily, we have two uh, great uh, experts on Chinese politics and economy to help us understand uh, what's been going on in China lately. First to my left, uh, my colleague, Chris Johnson, who's senior advisor and Freeman chair in China studies here at CSIS. Spent uh, 20 years in the US government as leading expert on Chinese elite politics and foreign policy. Uh, and he's continued to do that since he's been here at CSIS the last few years. Uh, and uh, enjoy to work with Chris every day. And I'm looking forward to his uh, insights as much as all of you. Uh, Denny McMahon is uh, with former reporter with the Wall Street Journal, was in China for six years, I believe. 10. 10, my <laughs> gosh. <laughs> and, uh, and then uh, he is now currently a fellow uh, at the Paulson Institute in Chicago. Uh, and he's author of a great new book, China's Great Wall of Debt, uh, which if you want to learn about what China's doing with its financial system and where it's going, uh, you should pick this up. And you won't get a great wall of debt buying it, I think, <laughs> I'm pretty sure. So, um, and uh, he, uh, after he left the journal, he was in Washington at the Wilson Center, uh, which is when he spent most of the time writing the book. And, and now he, he's in Chicago, uh, but here uh, for uh, today's event and also talking about his book in other parts of the city. So thank you both for being here today. I think the way we're going to proceed is, is how we uh, work as usual at CSIS. I'm just going to start off with a few questions uh, to Chris and Denny. Uh, and then after we whet your appetite, uh, and you all have built up some more questions. Uh, I'll throw things over to all of you, uh, and then we'll, and we'll take it from there, OK? Super. All right, well, let me first start uh, with, with Chris, because I think we'd agree, uh, at least on everything that we've been seeing and everything that my Chinese friends told me when I was in Beijing, that this is the historic, uh, most historic NPC in quite a long time, uh, and that a, a certain, certainly a big part of that uh, is the announcement about ending the two-term limit uh, for the president and vice president. Uh, the NPC voted uh, last Sunday to approve this constitutional amendment by a vote of 2,958 in favor, two against, and three abstentions. <laughs> so, so, so three interrelated questions, because I never can ask just one. Why did Xi Jinping push for this amendment when his power comes mainly from the party and being ahead of the military? Uh, 
How did he overcome opposition from others to push this through? And what are the implications for elite politics and governance in China? If I could, sorry to throw so much at you all at once. <laughs> I, was say, I think that's its own session. But <laughs> yes, <laughs> let it me, is. Okay, let me uh, let me try uh, to answer that briefly. You know, I, I do think um, it is. It, I think it's both the most significant development, and frankly, all of the commentary is a bit overwrought. Uh, you know, my own my own view is that if we've watched Xi Jinping since he arrived, um, it's been abundantly clear <laughs> that uh, he was on a pathway toward consolidation of power and toward ruling for a significant period of time. Um, I have to admit, um, my own public track record on this is, is clear, and that is uh, my view had been that he would step aside, at least from formal positions, um, in 2022. Pro not because of institutionalization or any sort of foolish notions like that, but rather because um, he would adopt the sort of standard practice of a more traditional Chinese leader, which is to um, have no official titles but still be calling all the shots in the mold of you know, Deng Xiaoping or, or Mao Zedong. So in terms of why, and to your question about the state presidency, it is interesting. You know, typically the office really hasn't mattered that much other than for its protocol purposes. I think it is quite revealing about what it tells us about the role of the state presidency in modern China and in reflection of modern China's global ambitions in that the state presidency is indeed the access point um, to being able to play a global role. You know, time has changed. Uh, Mohammed no longer goes to the mountain. You don't go and visit Deng Xiaoping in his courtyard home down the alleyway. Um, you know, you have to be out on the world stage if you want to be uh, sort of uh, creating this global role for China. So I think that's part of the puzzle here. Um, the official explanation gives us some justification for that as well, which is to say, in effect, these positions are now considered a holy trinity um, that cannot be um, broken apart and have any threat you know, of being broken apart. I also think very pragmatically, this is very consistent with Xi Jinping's um, penchant for putting, shall we say, exclamation points on <laughs> some of the decisions he makes. So for example, since the Party Congress, when I've traveled to Beijing talking to Condens, there's been a lot of mumbling about, well, we didn't deal with the succession issue. Uh, at the Party Congress. So I believe this is probably Xi saying, okay, well, I just dealt with it. There's not going to be one um, anytime soon. Uh, so I think that's uh, very significant. And I think also it probably gives us some hints structurally about what Xi's ultimate intentions might be. You'll recall in the run-up to the Party Congress, there was a lot of speculation uh, with regard to um, the idea of perhaps going back to a chairmanship system or maybe even a Russia-style presidency model, uh, so-called two plus one. You know, there's been a lot of discussion about this. Um, this and the retention of Wang Qishan in the vice presidency actually tell me that that's probably long range where Xi Jinping is going. And you know, as a good dialectical thinker who certainly believes in contradictions and so on, one thing he will know from having pushed this thing through is the target on his forehead, back, wherever you want to put it, is even larger. You know? um, and that tells me that, in fact, he will be highly incentivized to continue to both frequently and radically shake up the system to keep his opponents off balance. So um, from a volatility point of view, I think that's what should concern us. Um, you know, sort of the second question about opposition, I'm not fully convinced there was significant opposition um, to, this, uh, to this move. There was a lot of murmuring about it and mumbling, I think, but most elites in China, I think, have well accepted for some time that uh, she is going to be playing this, this sort of super role. You know, there was an interesting uh, WeChat video that circulated of Jiang Zemin with playing with calligraphy and writing, you know, I'm very sad that all of my friends have become ghosts, you know, and so on. So that's certainly subtle protests, right? Um, and again, I think this leads to Xi's pension for exclamation points. But from what I can tell, there wasn't a bunch of significant opposition, and she played this as I suspected he would, just like he played the issue of the core, which was to internally sort of say, no, 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 I couldn't possibly, and then have his uh, associates in the provinces and so on start clamoring right, and roll the process for it. I mean, what's quite striking from the official explanation is that this happened in a matter of months, You know, whereas last time we had significant um, uh, revisions to the state constitution, which were much more minor in terms of their content, it took almost a year, uh, a year and a half, actually, to, to get it done, so that's interesting. Um, in terms of what it means for elite politics, I think it's an open question. You know, really, the question is, 
um, is the idea that he will stay on for a considerable period of time going to lead us toward classic authoritarian sclerosis? Or is this centralization of power actually useful in terms of helping them break through on several of these tough challenges uh, that they've been facing, controlling vested interests and so on? And I think a lot of that will depend on how he chooses to empower these several people who are very interesting to us. I know we'll talk more about them today, Wang Qishan, Liu He, uh, to actually take on some of these tough challenges. Okay. Terrific overview, as always, um, and uh, a, a lot to buy into. We'll come back to some of these specific issues in just a minute. Um, one of the other uh, signs of, of protest was uh, the uh, photographs of a reporter who was rolling her <laughs> eyes. Right? And, uh, this, and, and so, uh, the, Denny, I don't know if you ever rolled your eyes at a press conference <laughs> in, in, in Beijing. But uh, let me ask you about the NPC's treatment of the economy. Um, Li Keqiang's work report uh, and, um, at the beginning of the two sessions contained some gaudy and impressive numbers for economic growth and uh, the restructuring of the economy towards services, uh, the rapid rise of high tech. Uh, and the reports uh, made on the fiscal situation and finances both seem reassuring, though clearly they believe there's a little bit more work to do on the financial system and stabilizing it. Uh, yet the book uh, that you have uh, just written is, seems to be a little bit gloomier points out to significant dangers in the economy. So how do we square the circle with, uh, do we, does she and his team deserve credit for managing this balance between growth and limiting financial risks? And, and how do you see that playing out in the NPC that's ongoing right now? Yeah, of course. Well, I mean, certainly she and his current administration have made some progress towards reforming the economy. I think perhaps the most significant headway they, they've made is actually reining in industrial overcapacity, which is something which has been on the agenda for a very long time, but ne no one's ever really been able to make headway on. And the reason that's significant is that's helped, last year at least, create the sort of perfect storm that allowed them to balance economic growth, fast economic growth, while slowing the pace of debt, uh, debt accumulation. So reigning in industrial overcapacity allowed the price of commodities to go up, which allowed corporate earnings to rise. At the same time, uh, the global economy improved, and so Chinese exports went up, which also helped companies deal with their, their debt burden. Um, however, the problem is these sorts of conditions aren't necessarily going to be sustainable. So you take uh, commodity price inflation. I mean, that's always already on the way down. You take something like exports. I mean, stronger exports helping the Chinese economy isn't a function of reform. That's something that China has to kind of rely on the you know, global conditions to kind of benefit from. And it's certainly not something they can rely on in the long term, particularly given the trade tensions that are, that are building between the US and, and China. Um, and the other aspect of this equation as well is the financial system. So certainly we saw uh, uh, corporate borrowing stall last year, which was fantastic. We still saw um, overall debt levels increase because households borrowed more, the government borrowed more. Um, but having said all that, the PBOC, real, the central bank, really did make some genuine headway in dealing with financial risk by focusing on uh, into bank lending. So this has been a, a big concern for the last few years because you know, banks and financial institutions have been lending more and more to each other. And so it's kind of raised the spe spectre of financial contagion. If there's some sort of shock to the financial system, something that may have other, otherwise been a sort of a, a isolated cri an isolated problem will now potentially sort of flow through the, the entire financial system. Um, and the central bank finally managed to start de, uh, you know, uh, sort of pulling apart some of those uh, interbank networks that have built up over the last few years. I think we saw interbank wealth management products decline by 3.5 trillion RMB last year, which is, which is not insignificant. But what's interesting about this, and the, C the China Banking Regulatory Commission made this point in January, is that um, what allowed them to continue to grow the economy whilst reigning in financial risk last year is that this, what they managed to squeeze out of the financial system was what they called idle cash, which was kind of code for sort of leverage speculation. Now, if they continue on this sort of route and kind of try and suppress risk in the financial system, continue to try and deleverage, at some point there, there is going to come a moment where that affects the ability of the economy to grow. Um, and, that, and, and then sort of we're going to get to see just sort of how committed the government is to uh, deleveraging, reining in financial risks and whatnot. So as Scott pointed out, my book does take a fairly gloomy perspective on the Chinese economy. Um, and 
over, and the reason for that is over my course of, of 10 years as a journalist in China, I'd say that the, the dominant economic trend that I saw wasn't that the Chinese government is an amazing reformer, but it was quite the opposite, that every effort at top-down economic reform was either stonewalled or got the runaround by lower levels of government and state-owned firms. And when I say got the runaround, what typically that meant is that lower levels of government would implement the uh, letter of whatever rule they were being required to implement, and then they, the actual spirit would be flouted. Um, and I think we see that very clearly with uh, local government debt, for example. So this has been an issue since 2009. Um, governments have, central governments have repeatedly tried to deal with the issue. This isn't just a Hu Jintao, Wen Jiabao problem. I mean, the biggest effort at trying to rein in local government debt was by Xi Jinping in 2015, when we had what, what was perhaps the most expansive effort at reform at, of the time. And generally speaking, I mean, certainly we in the media thought, OK, this, this issue is done. You know, the government has managed to rein in the risk, we can move on. And then two years later, Xi Jinping himself is saying in speeches last year that local government debt has, is one of the two greatest threats to financial stability. Mm. And so taking all that into account, that's kind of why I'm gloomy about the Chinese economy. But it's also why I think, sort of bringing it back to the, what's happening with the NPC, is that the single greatest economic reform that's being pushed by Beijing at the moment isn't actually explicitly economic. It's political. Because this is about, the, to the extent that Xi Jinping can shift power from the government apparatus to the party, for him to be able to improve the discipline over the party, and for him to be able to concentrate that control over the party in his own hands, will potentially give him the mechanism whereby he can break down that, that sort of behaviour whereby other aspects of the government have felt free to be able to uh, work against top-down economic reform. Super, super insightful, and um, both big picture and what, it, what we're seeing right now, uh, which is an excellent segue to uh, asking some questions about uh, the specific policies that the NPC has been debating over. And I think you've been very helpful because uh, in, in highlighting that in China, there is no policy area which is purely economic and one that is just purely political that they're all interconnected. And so uh, this is really, I think, a question for, for both of you, starting with, with Chris going, you know, in terms of the big issues that uh, they're talking about, um, the supervision law um, and what that means and uh, the government restructuring that they just announced uh, with, with the new chart uh, and reorganization. And obviously there's a question about corruption and you know, limiting it, but obviously that is directly relevant to this question of being able to implement the type of financial reforms uh, that Denny mentioned are so important mm -hmm. uh, that they've kept kicking the can down the road on. Are we seeing uh, that we're at the, uh, that they're not going to try and kick the can down the road anymore with these type of things and, and that actually they're now going to open the can and uh, <laughs> uh, really address it more pro appropriately. Sorry for the bad metaphor. <laughs> Um, well, it, you know, that remains to be seen, but I think that's certainly what the government is touting uh, yeah. with, with the changes. Uh, and I think we cannot separate and should not separate because they're a unified whole. Um, the move toward the National Supervision Commission and the steady movement, although halting, uh, toward um, really a super regulator for the financial system. You know, my own view is that they still, for whatever reason, can't seem to quite go all the way there, <laughs> but they're getting there in bits and pieces, and my sense is they will eventually get there, and this is why Leo Ha, for example, is acquiring so many titles and, uh, and, and so on. Uh, but on the supervision commission side, yes, I mean, I think, you know, there was a fundamental shift, and I think a lot of people missed it, perhaps including myself, in terms of its significance. Um, I would argue a year plus ago, where Wang Qishan, then still in his hat as uh, discipline chief for the party, began to make speeches that made clear they were shifting the focus of the CDIC's activity away from how many mistresses and cash you had stuffed in your couch and so on, you know, corruption issue, to this idea of discipline, which means following central instructions. And the theme that came out of the party congress of the centralized, unified leadership under Xi Jinping as the core, this is a, it's a, it's a sort of trite phrase, but it's also very important, I think, in terms of its meaning. Um, and the supervision commission is clearly designed to then take that process that Wang Qishan started and put it on steroids in the following manner. 
as the Central Discipline Inspection Commission, of course, its writ only extends to members of the party um, and party institutions and so on. The Supervision Commission will combine the CDIC's functions with the former state uh, entities that oversaw uh, prosecutorial functions and judicial functions, and this will allow them to reach anybody, basically, um, and that's very, very important. They're also adding bits and pieces whereby, for example, in the past, the recipient of bribes uh, would be the one that, you know, the discipline inspection people would focus on, not necessarily the giver. Uh, mm -hmm. Now the giver of the bribes will also be, you know, subject to the, the writ of this thing, which changes that dynamic that we often see between, and, and that actually uh, Yukon Huang wrote very helpfully about yesterday in terms of how mm -hmm. corruption, you know, theoretically can be good for the economy in terms of transferring assets from the state to the private sector. <laughs> uh, but uh, um, so, you know, the infrastructure is there, that's what I'm trying to say, mm -hmm. um, and, and how they'll do it is interesting. I take Denny's point about how the centralization uh, of power has that potential energy. One thing I worry a little bit about, and I think we've already seen a few examples of this though, is that if the problem before were that if local officials simply flouted these, um, at least the spirit of, of Beijing's intentions, you know, the idea of the mountains are high and the emperor is far, um, now they almost seem to be stumbling over themselves to implement central instructions, even when the conditions on the ground very clearly indicate that this is a bad idea, you know, a la the transfer from coal to um, natural gas heating, um, Tsai Chi's uh, pogrom against migrants in Beijing, you know, these, these sort of things. Um, and, you know, my view is these are, at the end of the day, largely sort of PR gaffes at worst uh, for, the, for the party, but they signal some potential for much more serious overcorrecting problems. Mm -hmm. Sure, certainly, certainly. But Danny, I want to ask you to weigh in on, this, on the same issues from your perspective. Um, what are the big things that we've heard so far, maybe related to government restructuring or some of the policy issues? And we know uh, that uh, when I was in China watching uh, the NPC, the, well, uh, there was a lot of conversation about the property tax law Mm -hmm. which uh, some people think is as important to the discipline, finding a financial source to being able to give discipline, not just the party's discipline. But what are the, what are the big takeaways that you see from the NPC in addressing uh, some of these problems, either policy-wise or, or in terms of institutions? Yeah, right. I mean, the policy, uh, the property tax is a great example because it's, this thing has been in the works for, for years and years. I mean, there are a lot of good reasons for implementing it, but it's the sort of thing that it's, uh, you know, until it's actually imposed, it kind of just feels like, I, I, like as I've written about how the uh, implementation of the property tax is, is just around the corner at least two or three times while I was a journalist. Um, and, and so it's, it's kind of difficult to get enthusiastic about. Um, but having said that, I mean, uh, it, it's a good example because talking about the government restructuring, another issue which was exactly like that was the, the combining of the financial regulators. Like I've done exactly the same thing. I've, I've written multiple stories about how now is the time to combine the, the banking insurance and the securities regulator. Um, and there have been times in the past where we've really seemed to be on the threshold of, of that happening. Um, for all intents and purposes, this should have happened a long time ago. I mean, the regime was set up for a very specific purpose because at the time, uh, those three types of financial institutions were very comfortably siloed in their own operations. The banks almost exclusively did deposit taking business, the securities companies were exclusively responsible for, for listed firms, and insurance companies, you know, self-explanatory. But certainly starting from about 2009 with the expansion, well, was really the start of the shadow banking system, um, sort of the, the borders between all three have been increasingly, increasingly blurred. So there's been an argument for, for quite some time that all three institutions, all three regulators should have, should have blurred. And so the thing about this reform is that uh, it's certainly uh, an, an advance. It's certainly you know, well, well, well needed, um, but it perhaps doesn't go all the way. You know, to, yeah, perhaps doesn't go to the extent that we'd kind of hoped or expected. So the reform is just the merging of the banking regulator with the insurance regulator. Um, the securities regulator still sort of remains out out there on, on their own as as an independent force. Um, the other thing to keep in mind as well, and Joe Xiaochuan wrote about this I think in November and what was kind of regarded as almost his kind of like farewell essay is that the problem with uh, the regulation of the financial system these days isn't just that things are falling 
in between the gaps of those three regulatory agencies. It's, just, it's also that there is a fourth financial regulator, and that is a lot of aspects of the financial system are regulated by local governments. Okay. And that the, financial, the, the way that the financial system has evolved over the last few years is that um, banks and shadow banks and trusts, they are always looking for uh, opportunities at regulatory arbitrage. And so as regulation has tightened on those sort of core businesses, things have migrated. Business, you know, uh, financial experimentation and innovation has you know, uh, migrated to sort of things like financial asset exchanges, which are regulated at a local level and don't get a government oversight. And so there's new places for the concentration of risk. So certainly this reform is, is fantastic in the sense that it's, it's long overdue, but at the same time it doesn't necessarily deal with all of the problems that need to be addressed in terms of financial regulation. I can just add yeah, two, sure. two quick points because Jenny's comment about uh, writing the same story over and over again reminded me <laughs> of something. Um, you know, I, when I was in government, I can remember similarly writing uh, several things about how um, the People's Liberation Army was about to undergo fundamental force restructuring, um, and it didn't happen. Um, and now it has. Yes. Uh, and so I think we need to be um, sort of very cautious in terms of just assuming, well, once again, it's not going to happen You know, this time. Yeah. Uh, in fact, Xi Jinping has shown a determination to do things that his predecessors tried and failed to do um, in those spaces. And you know, the way he's prioritized it, which is the politics and you know institutions like the military first and that economic stuff later, tells you um, quite a bit about how he thinks. And then just one other point, I think the thing that's most interesting that's outside of these uh, structural changes but really, really matters is I'll be a believer when they actually do the, uh, the fiscal rebalancing, which they're talking a lot about now. Um, frankly, I think both the most interesting but probably the hardest job that's going to be um, uh, had here in the coming years is finance minister because <laughs> the, the next finance minister is supposed to come up with the fiscal rebalancing plan, implement the property tax, <laughs> and do you know several other things that Loji Wei clearly was unable to do uh, sure. during during his time there. And so, you know, as to Denny's point, we squeeze down the uh, the places for them to recycle this cash and the LGFE pressure, you know, is especially important now at the local level. Um, there's going to have to be transfer payments to the center because the localities are screaming for resources and um, that will be interesting to see how it goes. Sure, sure. Um, I, mean, I wonder, just to, to riff a little bit off of what you both said, I mean, I, mean, I wonder if this uh, speaks to a uh, a common rule of financial reform in countries writ large, which is when there's a financial crisis, there is a lot of political momentum to do uh, shuffling of the bureaucracy and make changes and adopt laws. And if you don't have yeah. the, uh, that re pressure on you right then, then you go halfway or you take your foot off the gas. Uh, I think the US Congress, uh, part of it, just voted to uh, take their gas off a little bit on the Dodd-Frank reforms. Mm -hmm. So it's not something that's necessarily just Chinese. It may, may apply more broadly, although I think Xi Jinping's argument would be, actually, the big reform here is about strengthening the role of the party mm -hmm. and uh, controlling more directly. So while we're looking at the government changes, the, the party's role is important, as you all mentioned. All right, let's now get to the fun, fun part. Uh, which is the speculation part, which is about, <laughs> about uh, where, for which we have no responsibility to bear uh, on personnel, uh, because all of those, uh, very few of those decisions have been made uh, yet. Uh, but there's, uh, you know, several uh, people who uh, are being bantered around in the press, and certainly in, when we get to the 19th on Monday, they'll make these announcements, um, and. These probably matter a little bit for addressing some of these uh, real policy challenges. So we've got, you know, uh, Wang Qishan, Liu He. We have the central bank governor position open. Uh, we have uh, Li Keqiang, who, uh, you know, the head of the I call him the section chief of the state council now. <laughs> um, and um, uh, Yi Gang, Guo Shuqing, others. What are the big uh, personnel appointments that we ought to be looking for? Maybe, Denny, I'll start with you. What are the ones on the financial, economic, governance side who you think are going to matter most? Uh, that, and, and if you care to make a few predictions. <laughs> um, well, clearly, the, the single most uh, important vacancy that's coming up is the, the, the central bank governor. And if you like, we can talk about Joe a little bit later. But um, 
uh, in terms of who replaces him, I mean, there's been a lot of speculation as to what the... It's not necessarily that he will be replaced. It's that uh, the government may actually restructure the way that it manages the financial regulators and, and oversees the economy. So there is a sense that perhaps Liu He will assume that role and then uh, you know, somebody will be appointed under him to kind of you know, be in charge of sort of the daily management of the, of the, of the CBRC. Um, in terms of the two names that get bandied around most for central bank governor, it's with Yi Gang and Guo Xu Qing. Um, I don't have a lot of insight into, into Yi Gang. Um, you know, I, I spent a lot more time sort of reporting on, on Guo Xu Qing on my in my time. Um, I think this, certainly the foreign press, I think, has a real soft spot for, for Guo Xu Qing because, I mean, he's, when it comes down to it, I mean, he's been a real hard-charging financial reformer. I mean, he's only been at the um, China Banking Regulatory Commission for the last 18 months, but he's done more in terms of financial reform than anyone in that role pretty much since Liu Ming Kang. Um, you know, a lot of what he's doing is, is sort of going under the, under the radar, but it's a lot of sort of microeconomic for, re reform that is trying to, you know, aggressively pull the banks in line. I mean, in the last year in particular, I mean, the banks have really started, and to say it's aggressive is, is a bit of an exaggeration, but the banks have finally started disposing of and writing off non-performing loans in increasingly large volumes. Um, he, the, the, the banking, regular, uh, banking regulator is handing out fines left, right and centre to for all sorts of um, infractions on, on rules and regulations. And so, you know, if we were kind of looking for a real hard charging reformer, then I mean, I, I think he'd be a, a good fit for the, for, for the role, but that's kind of like the extent of my, my insights into, in, into those sort of, you know, into sort of the, the, you know, the Kremlin, Kremlinology of, the, of Zhongnan Hai. Um, and then the other big question is, is really, uh, you know, what can we expect of, of Liu He going forward? I mean, what sort of, you know, clearly the expectation is he is going to be in charge of, of the general direction of the economy and the financial system. Um, but maybe we can get, that, get into that a little bit later if you want. Okay, sure. Hey, Chris, let me turn to you and see uh, where you think uh, the people are going to end up and, and what the meaning of that is. Yeah. Um, well, I think um, most of it is... is uh, Fairly clear. I mean, you know, uh, Leo clearly is going to be the supremo uh, for um, the economy writ large, I think. Uh, frankly, his position in the financial area is a little strange, right? He's not someone who has a strong background um, in this space. And I think uh, to some degree this is uh, a knock, if you will, on him is that, well, he's a great theoretician and academic and sort of policy advisor, but he doesn't have the governance chops. Frankly, he doesn't have the political knife fighting chops that you need to be a vice premier and a Politburo member. This is something you often often hear and we're about to see. Uh, what he does have is a very clear backing from Xi Jinping. <laughs> and maybe that's all that matters um, uh, in this context. You know, and we hear and read and see a lot about his reform credentials, quote unquote, and so on. But it's important to remember he comes out of a sort of state planning uh, background. I think he thinks that way. Supply side is his invention. Um, you know, this is not someone who wants to see um, a market-based fire sale of state-owned assets. He fully supports Xi Jinping's desire to uh, grow the, you know, uh, and empower the state sector, um, produce global champions, you know, all this. So I think we just need to have our, our sort of uh, expectations correct. Uh, mm -hmm. And then it will be interesting to see, so what will be the emerging scenes, if you will, <laughs> between his authority and other people's ability to maneuver? And this is where I think Guo Xu Qing's role, if he isn't in the bank, is going to be particularly interesting. This is why I think actually he will not get it, uh, is because there are many people who, despite his many technical credentials, feel that he has a strong penchant to be too political. I think since he's been at CBRC, there's been a worry at the central bank that he would overcorrect, um, and they were constantly battling that by injecting you know, liquidity and so on into the system. Um, he missed once and was sent off to Shandong. Usually, <laughs> usually in the system, you don't get to miss twice. So my guess is he probably won't get it. Um, Yi Gang, I don't know. Uh, he certainly has the technical credentials. I think there's a case to be made that um, he was largely blamed for the mini devaluation debacle um, in 2015. He followed up by giving a very poor speech at the uh, uh, G20 meeting you know, that was hosted, uh, which should have really been a softball. So we'll see. Um, I think it, uh, it leaves the field somewhat open. Um, and then you know, how much will even Liu He, being empowered as he is, uh, have the ability to push upstream against whatever Xi Jinping's ambitions might be? I mean, I find it quite interesting. They seem to be on a very heavy course towards significant deleveraging this year, 
And then I think it's fair to say that at the Central Economic Work Conference in December, they started to backpedal a little bit. Um, was that because of conditions? Was that because they saw the wind direction <laughs> from on high? You know, these are uh, interesting questions. And then finally, I think the bigger question is, does even Liu He really matter when Wang Qishan is going to be around um, with this um, significant and yet blurry <laughs> massive portfolio, right, uh, which remains to be defined. Uh, I think that's very important. And then, of course, if you're Li Keqiang, I think you're sort of wondering why you go to work every day. But uh, that's, uh, that's my own view. Well, um, you get to leave at five at least, perhaps. <laughs> so, um, all right, let me ask one last question before I turn it over to the audience. Um, and. and uh, um, about foreign policy and, and defense. Um, at least in Beijing, it seemed uh, that these weren't uh, high priorities at, at the NPC. But some NPCs, uh, it actually has been pretty significant. Um, and as people may have heard, there may be a US-China trade war <laughs> or, or something like that. Um, and so there's lots of anxieties. And, and so this, you would think maybe it'd be something, even if there's not a piece of legislation where Deputies would want to be, uh, you know, showing off their nationalist chops, and we'd also see other types of conversation coming out of this event. Um, what do we make of, uh, you know, what are the foreign policy takeaways, defense policy takeaways uh, that we've heard uh, from this week, uh, or? Why is it such a non-issue if, if you don't think it's very important? Mm -hmm. I, I actually think it is important, and it's been sort of um, the quiet story, I think, to some degree. Um, one of, to me, the most uh, interesting and potentially exciting and, and challenging at the same time elements of the, the proposed government restructuring plan is the creation of this new um, international aid and doni, donor uh, body, right, which I believe is an effort to finally create a one-stop shop focal point for the Belt and Road Initiative. <laughs> we know that Xi Jinping is very frustrated with the fact that despite the policy having been around now for several years, if you try to identify one project <laughs> that can be uniquely branded as Belt and Road, that wasn't in the tool shed for the previous decade that was rebranded as, as, as Belt and Road, it's hard to find. Um, and it seems that the, um, the initiative has sort of lost some steam. There have been some recent press reporting about how uh, in energy-related investments, for example, tied to BRI, they're running out of money, or at least financing has, has sort of been a problem. So this seems to be an effort to sort of re-energize that. We've had the very interesting story um, in the press some weeks ago about how Chinese ambassadors abroad were going to be increasingly empowered, right, to sort of run an aggressive uh, uh, sort of, uh, you know, foreign representational um, opportunity. Uh, and frankly, we now have the most senior foreign affairs guys in senior positions that we've ever had. We're going to have Yang Jiechi as a Politburo member and potential vice premier. Um, it looks like Wang Yi is dual-headed as uh, foreign minister and state counselor, mm -hmm. and then Song Tao is going to play some kind of role somewhere around there. So they're, they're putting a lot of energy now into this, mm -hmm. and it comes out of the party congress, right? When yes. Xi Jinping in his speech says, we're standing firm and tall in the east, and you know, we increasingly we we're moving to the center of global affairs, they're putting money and institutional strength where their mouth is on that. Um, on defense, I mean, I think obviously the big issue is the headline number was uh, an 8% yeah. growth, which is below the double-digit growth they've been having um, you know, for a long time in the past. I think the commentary, which was not by accident, you know, the official commentary around that number is significant, which says, A, this is the new normal, so the defense establishment has to get used to that lower figure, and B, we're going to put it all into advanced weapon systems. So it doesn't suggest to me that they're slowing, you know, the pace of their military modernization at all. Um, rather, they're going to intensify it, taking advantage of the structural changes that Xi Jinping has made. Super, super. Any, any thoughts on that, th these? We're good. Okay, terrific. You, co you covered a lot. All right, so uh, let's uh, turn things over to you. I think we've got a microphone uh, that uh, will come to you uh, after I call on you. Uh, please identify yourself, your institution, and if you could keep your question short, uh, that would be super helpful. Let's start here in the front, on the right, if we could. Hello, oh, um, Chris McRae. Um, a simple question, but in two parts. Do you think that the wall of debt is actually bigger in China than it is in Europe or America? But actually, I'm more interested in whether we're wasting youth's livelihoods on sort of sustainability futures. So if that's different from debt, the way you define things, uh, which country, which of the three regions is worse than the, in those terms? <laughs> Okay, the, the issue in China isn't 
so much the absolute amount of debt. So if you're kind of taking the size of debt relative to the size of China's economy, it's broadly in line with that of the United States, although it depends on how you measure it, and China's shadow banking system kind of makes it a little bit difficult to know for sure. The issue at hand is the pace at which the debt has accumulated. So you look at the, the size of Chinese debt, say, let's say in 2008, around the China time of the, of the global financial crisis, and the pace at which it's accumulated today. Well, you look at other countries that have experienced a similar expansion in debt, and they're places like the United States prior to the subprime crisis, Thailand prior to the Asian financial crisis, um, Japan immediately prior to the lost decade, Spain prior to the Eurozone crisis. So you can kind of get the, 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 the issue. The issue is that, the faster debt accumulates, the harder it is to actually find productive places to put that money. And so it ends up in a whole lot of waste, in a whole lot of speculation. Now the thing is China's financial system works a little bit differently from elsewhere because no one in China is under any illusions that the government completely backs the system. In fact, everybody from the biggest bank to the lowest you know, ordinary person who buys some product from a, an online lender assumes that at some point, if something goes wrong, the government is, is sort of backing things up. And so there is sort of a degree of stability to that system because there is this, this, this faith in the, this ever-present safety net. But it's also, it's, it, it aggravates the risk levels because people feel they can keep adding, adding more and more debt. So that's kind of the problem when it comes to uh, uh, sort of the, the future of, you know, w whether it's sort of eating into the, the, the future of, of, of the next generation. I mean, the question is really how China disposes of the debt. Now, in a perfect world, it can avoid a crisis and then slowly deal with the debt, pay it off gradually over a period of time. And I think that's what they're trying to do at the moment. When, as I said, we've seen an increase in bank uh, dis loan disposals in 2017. If they can sort of maintain that pace of slowly cleaning up the, the, you know, the, the system over a five, six, seven year period, then it probably won't have a, a massive impact on sort of the, the, the next generation. However, the government's under no illusions that the system can't continue the way it is. I think it was a year ago or two years ago, Xi Jinping wrote, a, I, think it was a, I think it was a speech he gave to the party, which, was, in which he effectively said that we have a very small window to change the way the economy works because effectively with this debt-driven growth, we are eating into our future. And so it has to change. So and that might be the best, best place to leave it. So all the way in the back. Uh, thank you. Uh, si Yang, reporter from Voice America. Uh, I'd like to shift our uh, the focus to, from the d Chinese domestic issues to the issues between U.S. and China. Uh, you mentioned, you, you guys just mentioned that uh, in China, Wang, Wang Qishan, Yang Jiechi, Wang Yi might be in charge of foreign policy. And, but who are they going to talk to when they come to the United States? <laughs> the reason why I'm asking, because the South China Morning Post just wrote an article two days ago, said with the departure of Tillerson, it's harder for China to find somebody to talk to in Trump, President Trump's White House. Thank you. OK. All right, from Chinese politics to American politics, <laughs> uh, what do you guys uh, Oh, I, I'll take a stab at it. Uh, sure. You know, I, I think um, it's fair to say that um, despite, you know, some of these exciting changes in China, increasingly they look like the stable, predictable uh, one, <laughs> and we look like the opposite of that, uh, which is challenging. This issue of how to handle the relationship actually, I think, now goes back into the previous administration as well, where there was really no czar, if you will, for the China relationship appointed in the Obama administration. And I think they had sort of the idea in the first term, there were several people, I think, who kind of were filling the roles. Certainly Secretary Clinton was keenly involved. Secretary Gates was from his point of view. Um, and obviously uh, Secretary Geithner was very involved in the economic side of the relationship. Second term, it just kind of stumbled around. Nobody was really managing the relationship. And I think it was largely because the administration made the case with some justification. In many ways now, the relationship is too big for a single person to really be the, the, the focal point. There are too many issues. Um, one of the interesting things about the evolution and how we manage things 
under the Trump administration so far has been we really have returned to an era of president to president management of the relationship. They're the only two that make any decisions. It seems that pretty much the only time anything gets done in the relationship is when they meet. Uh, and um, you know things like the former SNED, now CED, the four dialogues, they're just not happening. Um, and that's mainly you know, from the US side. Um, China, I think both with Yang Jiechi's visit and then again with Liu He's visit and probably murmurings from the sidelines from Wang Qishan's office, they've been asking for the administration to appoint someone as the sort of pig person, and they're wondering who that can be. One of the challenges we might face, I think, is that if Wang Qishan is indeed overseeing the bilateral relationship, China will be quick, I think, to get hung up on protocol issues and say, well, who's equivalent in terms of stature to, uh, to meet with Wang Qishan? They do seem to have done some analysis of the former Gore Chernomirdin process, um, and they of course can see that Vice President Pence has that relationship with Taro Aso in Japan. Um, so perhaps they're thinking about something uh, similar to that. But it's a it's a real problem, and and the the energy, or if you will, the sort of uh, ball is in the court of the U.S. administration to figure out what it wants to do. But with reshuffling the cabinet on a daily basis, uh, it's kind of difficult to uh, find out. And, and also the trend line seems to be toward people who take a dimmer view of, of China. That presumably will be true of Secretary Pompeo. Um, if John Bolton comes in as national security advisor, that would certainly be the case. So um, let's wait and see. Yeah. Uh, I would just, um, just uh, Two finger on that. That I, the Chinese desire to have an interlo a single interlocutor, to some extent, may assume, uh, based on in addition to what you just said, that that person has a stake in a stable relationship with China. You're correct. And uh, it may be no matter who they talk to, whether it's a single person or a group of people, they won't define that person, and so they may end up being un unhappy with the substance, even if uh, they get the, st the format that they want. I'm going to come to the third row here to Marcus. Thank you for, uh, for the event and for great uh, remarks. I am from the IMF, but I will not represent IMF views here. <laughs> uh, so two views I've heard on this political change in China, and I'm just wondering what your, your perspective is on that. One is that you know, um, reforms really only have really got going in the last year, seriously. And we are already in the second term of Xi Jinping, uh, of Xi, uh, She's presidency. So if there were a serious term limit, you would expect the second term very soon to become kind of a lame duck and with diminishing reform power. So in a sense, that's, you know, continuity really is the only way forward for serious reforms. Second, our own experience really has been, and in many of these reform areas, it's actually, as you said, it's the middle-level bureaucracy and the vested interests down there which hold it back. And you know, whenever you go on anything on, uh, uh, let's say, BRI, for example, you know, when we want to make uh, critical remarks, we get a lot of resistance from the mid-level bureaucracy. When we go to the seniors, we hear, you should say it. It is, you know. So I really see this reform as a top-down reform agenda. Combine the two, and then you look at the economy, lots of these reforms really are very long-term projects. Ginny, you have mentioned the sort of delays on the fiscal reforms that have been happened. But if you look at it seriously, there's, you know, there's, there's three legs of this, which is the budget process, medium-term budgeting, more transparent. It's cleaning up the financing, which is opening up the front door, closing the back door, shutting off local governments from financing, et cetera, et cetera. And it's the vertical imbalance. Local governments don't have the money to spend what they need to spend. So this is a 10-year project. And it's started, but of course, a lot of that uh, has, to, has to continue. So a lot of things are going on. And uh, my sense is it's going in the right direct direction much more intensely in the last year. The one critical thing that's still out there, and the question is, what happens if growth really falters as a result of these reforms? Will they be able to go on? Now, my view is that they will not allow growth to falter seriously, nor should they because it would seriously risk stability in China and globally. So that leaves us with the question, can China reform with growth? And this, in my view, requires long-term, steady, top-down effort. So from that perspective, the two questions really are, what does it mean? Now, 
you know, obviously, of course, we risk atrophy, and we do already see that this entrenchment of power from the top creates signs of atrophy that the critical views don't filter up. But my sense is there is not really a lot to filter up from the bottom up anyway. <laughs> <laughs> anyway so I just leave you with these two thoughts that, you know, I think uh, put a bit more of a balanced view into just criticizing what's going on there. Okay. So thoughts on the this big meta debate about the two ending two term limits political stability as a alternative as a way to get at these hard reforms or atrophy volatility that you mentioned in the your initial remarks um, where where do you think opportunity or yeah. big problem I, I think really this is uh, reflective of the debate we've been having since Xi Jinping showed up you know and it, and, and it became, started to become clear that he was going to move in in this direction, which for me was the day he entered office, but <laughs> I think for a lot of other analysts it took until the party congress. Um, you know, and basically it is at core, is what he's doing uh, a reflection, uh, is it a means in and of itself? Uh, is it a reflection of him being a power mad megalomaniac like Mao? Or is he more of a pragmatist who's doing what he thinks needs to be done for the system? I think if you look at the track record on balance, it looks much more like the latter to me. Uh, there are worrying cult of personality-esque <laughs> elements to, um, to Xi's uh, time in office. Um, but I think your core observation, which is that it takes a lot of time to manage these things. These challenges grew up over 40 years, so they can't be resolved within one. Um, and I think we have to take into account, which people seem to miss regularly, Xi Jinping has different priorities than, say, Liu He does. You know, his priority was, I control the political system <laughs> first, and that takes time. He had to break the back of the various, um, you know, factions inside the system. He had to control the military. You know, Hu Jintao's great mistake was, and it wasn't his own fault, he knew what he needed to do, he was just never enabled to do it because he had insufficient power. You have to control the key levers of power in order to be able to initiate these type of reforms. What is that? It's the military, it's the security services, the party bureaucracy, and propaganda, right? And it's taken Xi Jinping five years to get control of those, and as a sort of political guy, these were his instincts. Um, I agree with you, I think, but in the last year we see him now turning to some of the unfinished business of the rest of that agenda. Um, there are risks of atrophy, there are risks of uh, overcorrection and so on. I will differ with you slightly and then I think perhaps they might have enough steel in the belly to, uh, to risk growth uh, in order to do what they want to do. Although, I think you're correct in saying that they seem to be trying to have their cake and eat it too. You know, the message from the Central Economic Work Conference clearly to me is controlling risk is enough to help us, you know, do what we need to do and not sacrifice gross in the process, so why should we bother? I think where they'll run into the wall on that, as Denny pointed out, is let's say roughly this summer when the tailwind from last year runs out of steam and they have to make decisions about whether to stimulate or not. Yeah. I, I want to just touch on the, the question, I mean, you, you know, China has to keep growing at a certain pace, you know. um, so how do they do it? Right? And there is, I mean, you read Li Keqiang's work report, and it's been a theme for the last few years, but I mean, he says it time and time again in his speech, it's like, we need to develop new drivers of growth. Right? So the question is, what is the new economic model? Um, and what I find interesting is, is certainly outside of China, but it's also sort of an idea perpetuated in China is that we don't need to worry about the big problems in China because once the government recognises the problems, they'll always be able to fix it. And certainly <coughs> Beijing and Xi Jinping has the plan. It's supply side structural reform. But what's interesting is it took a long time to actually get to that plan and a couple of very important um, false starts. Now, in my book, I actually spent a lot of time writing about urbanisation um, because when I left the journal in mid-2015, um, we were still in an era, era, an era when uh, Beijing was talking about, well, specifically, Li Keqiang was talking about mm. how urbanisation was going to be the driver of growth. Yeah. It's like the old model wasn't working, urbanisation was going to drive it. Um, as recently as, uh, <coughs> I think it was end of 2015, beginning of 2016, when Lo Ji Wei was turfed out as Minister of Finance, he was still giving speeches about um, how China has to, effectively, he was still advocating liberalisation, that the growth drivers had to be uh, liberalising the economy, injecting, not, not liberalisation for its own sake, but injecting competition to be able to make the economy more efficient. He was talking about things like land reform, breaking down the monopolies. 
Um, and so you kind of had, there was never this clear vision coming out of Beijing as to what the future of Chinese economic growth was going to look at. So in the end, they sort of settled on this idea of um, supply side structural reform, which I think more than anything is born out of this fear of the middle income trap. That you know, China has to make the, the leap from uh, low end, low cost manufacturers and heavy industry to more technologically advanced industries. The way we're going to do that is not by liberalization, um, it is uh, not by clearly by urbanization. It's going to be a forced march into the industries that we think are going to be strategically important. Now, there's no. It might be. A, it might be a raving success. I mean, Lord knows that strategy worked for steel and shipbuilding and um, solar panels and cement and aluminium until you ended up with rabbit over capacity. Um, but it could be a successful strategy. But there's no reason to suggest that it necessarily is, particularly given that this was really only one of a number of ideas that were being debated back and forth for a very long time. And just to put a sharper point on that, I mean, I think uh, the process we've watched is from sort of the giddiness surrounding the third plenum uh, to a more realistic um, settling in the middle that is more, frankly, in line with what their political setup dictates they do. Yeah, I would just add um, onto that just to sharpen the point even further that um, you could get plenty of, of growth with reform, liberalizing reform, uh, but you would create a loser and they don't want, that would be state owned enterprises, and they don't want SOEs to lose. So therefore, you limit the type of choices that you can potentially make if there's certain folks that you don't that you want to be on the winning side, which means that you have to do it. You have to do that. Find that Goldilocks space, right? So in the front, right here. I can remain seated, just like the other two guys, right? <laughs> I've always viewed. Uh, just here, identify yourself. Oh, David Wu. Okay. Uh, I've always viewed uh, reporters as uh, barometers of uh, elite opinions, uh, just as uh, bus drivers or uh, taxi drivers are barometers of the opinions of common people. I had uh, two very interesting experiences with Chinese reporters. Uh, one, two, or three years ago, with a reporter who had just come from China. Uh, who was uh, a real party loyalist, but he mentioned this uh, potential removal of term limits, and he seemed to look at it with some concern. And this week, I was interviewed by a Chinese reporter, uh, and it was um, supposed to be about this Congress, and he wanted to, it seemed like he was avoiding, to some extent, this uh, larger issue of the removal of term limits. And he wanted to, more to talk about these other issues, such as elevation of it, the environment to a ministerial level. And when we did talk about the removal of term limits, um, I uh, was somewhat elliptical and move the issue to how great countries seem to take a longer period of time to um, consider these kinds of changes. And also in 2004, it took uh, China 15 months. I expected big pushback, and there wasn't. Mm. And my view is when there's not pushback uh, from someone like him, there's general agreement. Uh, how do you didn't, uh, well, you said earlier, that there didn't seem to be much concern among Chinese elites. Uh, is there some undertone of concern about this and a wait and see to see how much, uh, how well it'll turn out? Yeah. Um, my point was not to suggest there wasn't concern among elites. I think there is significant concern among elites, especially the liberal intellectual elite. Um, but what's important to remember is, A, the party has spent most of its history persecuting the liberal intellectual elite in China. Um, and B, I don't think Xi Jinping in particular really cares about their opinions. Uh, so you have to sort of put that to one side. Um, for me, it comes back to the practicality of it, which is that the system itself um, doesn't change in terms of you know its sort of core fundamentals. You know the the sort of fantasy that it was moving toward uh, institutionalization. You know over the last ten years or so, the system has to remain what it is, or it will cease to exist. That's just sort of um, its operating uh, philosophy, and that's what Xi Jinping I think is is implementing. So you know there is resistance. I think the key issue is now it's about does Xi Jinping stumble in some way because. 
you know, it, the challenge with opposition in systems like China's or any other authoritarian system is that you often can't see it until it's already activated, right? Uh, because it goes to ground in periods where, um, you know, it, uh, we have a forceful player like Xi. Um, and to my point earlier, I think this will incentivize him to continue to sort of keep everyone else in the system off balance. That's been a consistent pattern of his behavior um, since he arrived, and, and I don't expect that to change. So there is concern, there is opposition. You know, it's not coincidental that you know, uh, internet searches for immigration shot through the roof when you know the uh, uh, when um, the initiative was announced. And you can see, to your point, the government's handled it a bit. Um, haphazardly, right? So the announcement was released in English. That person was subsequently punished. Um, you know, there's been a lot of back and forth, and the official explanations have a certain undertone of "thou dost protest too much" in terms of trying to explain why this is a good idea, and they don't want to talk about it. They're busy highlighting all the other constitutional changes and so on. So that does tell us that you know there's a general mood of wariness, and I think to some degree uh, it confirms the worst fears uh, among some in the elite about what they thought maybe Xi Jinping had in mind, uh, and that's significant. Okay, great. Um, we've only got a few more minutes left, so why don't we take a series of questions together, and we'll start with, the, in the fourth row, the, the, the neighbors who both have their hand up, and then we'll come here. And, and so we'll just take a series, a collection of questions, and let Chris and Denny answer uh, to them both. So they can intervene. Yeah. Good morning, and I'm Yuan Xinfang from Georgetown University. I'm curious about the local government debt problems. And actually, before Xi Jinping, like um, the local governments have huge uh, responsibility, but the uh, accountability did not match that authority. And there is huge hidden debt problems. And I'm thinking, like, I'm wondering whether the central government has a really clear picture of the hidden that problems and is it controllable? Okay. Uh, Sergey Kostyev, a PhD student and part-time lecturer at uh, Rutgers University in New Jersey. Uh, could there be a disagreement, I mean, uh, among Chinese officials about how to respond to Trump decision on tariffs? Thanks. Okay, tariffs. Okay, then we're gonna come right here. Hi, uh, Lu Zhenghua from South China Morning Post. Um, whoever uh, Wang Qishan uh, will, would meet uh, his counterparts in the USA, uh, I wonder um, what kind of approach uh, uh, the China could take uh, uh, dealing with, with now the tensions between US and China. Would uh, the so-called old friend diplomacy uh, still working? And would these uh, requests or demands put by the Trump administration is negotiable in, in, in a short period of time. Um, yeah, thanks. Okay. All right, do we have one more on this side, folks who want to come in? Are we, got, are we good? All right, so we've got three questions out there. You guys can split them up however you'd like. I want to do Let's debt. start with Dick. Okay, I'll, I'll lead with local government debt. Um, All right. I think one of the reasons why uh, local government debt is so difficult to control is that so much is actually asked of China's local governments. So to bring this back to the MPC again, what was quite interesting about the Ministry of Finance's work report is that, uh, and combined with Li Keqiang's, is so for 2018, we still have a growth target of 6.5%, right? At the same time, uh, the central government is going to run a lower budget deficit this year than it did last year. At the same time, the central government is winding back significantly on a lot of taxes, so the, the, which is great. I mean, this is less tax bur burden for industry, but it also means less money is going into the government coffers. At the same time, Xi Jinping's priorities for 2018 are poverty alleviation and cleaning up pollution, on top of all the other expectations that local governments currently have, which is spending more on things like education and healthcare. So at the end of the day, you've got this situation where the central government really wants to have its cake and eat it too. It's telling local governments that uh, we need to grow just as quickly, there's less money available, and by the way, you've got to do all these other things as well. <laughs> and so how do they do that? I mean, the way they've been doing it for the last decade is that, okay, we maximise our tax revenue by growing as quickly as possible, and the fastest way to grow as quickly as possible on short notice is to borrow money and build something. So this is kind of, it's almost the Lord make me chase, but not just yet. It's this desire to 
main, you know, maintain fast economic growth, but not necessarily willing to make the sacrifices to, to ensure that it happens. And so this is the problem, really, for the local governments, because the burden falls on them. Um, I think the first one was about sort of differences in the Chinese government about uh, response to the US-China trade war. Um, who knows? You know, it's an opaque system. I, 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 think, um, I think there are perhaps two streams of, of thought on this. Um, one which probably is the majority view and represents that of the top leadership and one that maybe is a, a sort of minority view. Uh, the first view being um, we should try to avoid this at all costs. Uh, you know, to Denny's uh, point earlier, to the degree they made any um, success in their efforts to deleverage the financial system last year, a huge part of that was the global updraft that they had and exports. You know, so the last thing they need is a trade war with the United States if they want to continue the deleveraging agenda this year, and I think they do. Um, and I don't think we would have seen two envoys, Yang Jiechi and Liu He, in rapid succession, followed by an unprompted phone call from Xi Jinping to discuss the issue, unless the Chinese were sort of keen to avoid it. Um, so I think that uh, lends toward the idea of let's see if we can solve this. There is also, though, I think a lot of head scratching about this hundred billion, you know, uh, dollar issue. How do we achieve it? Um, you know, there was a good article this morning, sort of saying you can't buy as many Boeing's and soybeans and so on as you, you know, typically the things you would do um, that you used to do, and the other ways are more challenging. And I think to some degree, there's a constituency in the Chinese government who says Trump is a paper tiger. He talks a lot about these issues. Um, let's say that he goes there with a 301 investigation in a fairly full-throated way. Um, it will be difficult, but we will survive. The United States will be shown to be the paper tiger they are. And oh, by the way, we'll go around and sweep up all the pieces from them having shot their allies in the face with things like 232 um, and, and so on. And I think also when they look at the rollout of something like the aluminum and steel tariffs, they see a lot of noise, but then they see carve-outs straight away. Um, and they say, well, maybe the bite isn't quite as bad as the bark. So probably what's happening inside the government is they're trying to balance their approach in terms of carrot and stick, retaliation and things they might do to try to solve the problem. And my sense is they're going to withhold judgment on how to handle that until they see what we actually do. Um, and then on the does the old Lao Peng Yo game work, uh, you know, and so on. I think that's a significant question. And to Scott's earlier point, you know, it's really, is anyone on the administration side listening, right? You know, if you look at Liu He's agenda when he came here, he basically had three priorities. One was to sort of get the dialogues reestablished, no answer. <laughs> Two was to present sort of a long laundry list of things, interestingly, China wanted, which probably showed some disconnect for, for, for where we are. Um, and, and three was to sort of um, see if they couldn't appoint a point person, you know, to, to, to sort of manage the relationship. That also didn't happen. So, you know, how we manage that, I think, going forward, one of the challenges I think we face with the potential trade issue is that certainly I think on the Chinese side, maybe some on our side, there's a view that, okay, the U.S. will do something, China will respond, then we'll put our guns on the table and sit down and talk. Both parties have to agree that's the strategy. Uh, before we can have it, we run into a problem. So I think that's really where the challenge lies. Well, I think uh, what we've uh, heard today uh, about China's uh, National People's Congress in the two sessions is a, uh, a sign and contrast, right, between what's going on in, in Beijing and here. It was interesting, the president, um, I guess it was about 10 days ago, tweeted after this initial news about Xi Jinping's that he thought that was neat. And uh, he's like, he thought, well, maybe that could happen here too. <laughs> so well, uh, I think if we did a survey, we might find a little bit different type of polling results <laughs> as a result. But it, um, in any case, I think what you, uh, we really appreciate helping us clarify everything that China seems to be juggling in terms of um, the uh, bureaucracy, uh, the leadership, uh, the personnel. Um, and we've got, in a few days, we will get the final answers on some of those questions. For others, we're going to need to wait some time, but you guys have given us a good roadmap to look ahead for at least the next year or more on what the big issues are and what we might be able to expect uh, in China and with the bilateral relationship as well. Uh, so please, everybody, join me in thanking uh, Chris and Denny.